If you have no need for the wrestling, you're not going to wrestle. But should someone out there entice you, tempt you, and you do wrestle, you wrestle with the intention of beating me. Then you wrestle with the intention of just being around me. I don't really care if you win or lose. Then you wrestle with the intention of me winning. And you realize that there are different parts of you that are born, then they die, a different part is born. And with every new part that is born, with every new Alex, comes brand new desires, brand new intentions that did not previously exist. Now, what makes all of our lives in this classroom safe is that most of our conversations are born in this class and die in this class. Do you go home? Are you curious about some of the things we talk about? Yes. Do you find yourself once in a while passionate? Yes. Is that passion intense and strong enough to force you to walk away from the things of life you've accumulated? The answer is no. But should you and I wrestle, and should you experience some compatibilities, this wrestle that was the outcome of curiosity may all of a sudden propel you into passion. Now, the word passion is pasco, which means suffering. You can suffer in two ways. Well, I guess you only suffer in one way, really, that well, you suffer in many ways. First, you suffer because there is this need inside you, this longing inside you, you want something and you don't yet have it. And you struggle and that struggle creates pain. Then you have it and then you have more struggle because you want to keep it. Then depending on the depth of what you possess, if your companion is only good for sex, well, it's only two weeks, maybe a month, maybe a year. Eventually, it's going to fade. If it's the beauty of their body and the beauty of their emotions and the beauty of their intellect, you're in this game for about 10, 15, 20 years until you're no longer interested in those things. That you become a bit more self-sufficient, autonomous, independent, where you can generate those emotions for yourself on your own. <clears throat> there does come a point, if you're not careful, that, and it's something we talked about in class yesterday, it, it is true that perhaps once in a while when we talk about these ideas, I spit out the name Plato or Socrates or Sartre, but the truth is, you're not going to fall in love with Sartre. You may go out there and read his book, you know, being a nothingness. Uh, but the truth is, eventually you're going to come to my class. I was the one who spit out the name Sartre that entered your ears and this bucket we call the consciousness where you hold experiences. Uh, and then as our relationship grows, you will find what you do in life less interesting. Now, for now, this is unfathomable to you. Unfathomable to you. You say, no, it's not going to happen. Okay. But if you're not careful, it will happen. And then you realize now you're on a quest that you never imagined yourself to be on. <clears throat> and one of the nice things about questing after wisdom is because information other people can give you. Knowledge other people can give you. Data, other people can give you. Wisdom is reserved for very, very, very few people with very, very, very rare qualities who for some strange reason have walked into a certain space, meetings, one, not a lot, just one very, very interesting person who throws them into the world of the desert 
and the only person who's able to create some shade, some safety, is that person. That is the only tree that can provide shade. And then um, you will find your solace just underneath the shade of this particular tree. And there becomes a point, uh, it's something that Samuel had said uh, in the last uh, class uh, before he was leaving, that once you see the Buddha on the road, kill him, okay? You have to be with this person for a long while. And two things happen. First, you're questing after wisdom, then you realize you don't really much care about wisdom, what you care for is this person. We have forgotten your original quest, which was, I'm here to understand the kingdom of God within. Then after a while you realize you don't really care for that. You're more interested in the kingdom of God that lives inside this other fellow. There comes a point if you have a good teacher and he or she is honest and has gone through the steps in the proper way, they look at you and they say, I'm not here to gather disciples or students. I'm here to make students and then when they're mature to let them go so they can go on this quest on their own. And that's the thing about wisdom, that it stays in the darkness, you know, and it waits and waits and waits until there is a worthy seeker. And then there comes a point where you have to walk away from the Buddha, from the teacher who wrestled with you, who manipulated you, exploited you, coerced you into loving him or her because of the wrestling. And then there comes a point they look at you and say, you know, don't call me anymore. And it's a shock to your system because you want to understand, you know, you've uh, been invited to this person's house and various other gatherings, but all of a sudden he just cut you off or she has cut you off. And a couple of things can happen. You can be so bitter and so angry that you will no longer think about your quest and you say, um, I'm just going to spend the rest of my life on Facebook telling everyone how awful this human being is. That's one way you can do it. The other is after some whining, after some sadness and depression and loneliness and all that, you realize, and I, I don't know how this happens, you remember your orig original intentions. I want to go out there and figure out life for myself. And something about you just breaks open. He was my crutch or she was my crutch for the past 10, 15, 20, 30, 40, 50 years. But now I have the proper tools. And you want to know this for a long time. And then as you go through this journey and as life offers you experiences, you realize you have teeth. Now you can chew. Um, and of the 10, 20 things that they chew, you can actually swallow five of them. And your body spits out four, but digests one. And by the time you take in 20, you chew five, but you only swallow one, you are in a place where you're content. You know exactly what your capacity are is, and there is no lust or greed in you for wanting to chew and digest everything that comes your way. And you say, you know what? This is what I can do and I'm fine with it. If you have no need for the quest, you have no need for it. If you have no passion or love, you have no passion or love for it. If you don't, if no one walks into your life to manipulate you into this wrestling match, well, there is no need for it, you know. Uh, there are also a couple of other footnotes, let me just say them. Do you mind if I make this a bit more personal? Is that okay? And forgive my hubris and arrogance, but you guys already know how arrogant and hubris I am, so I'll be okay. Uh, 
when I w was th about 35 or so, I would meet with people all the time, all the time. And I would invite them to our gatherings every week. Which meant that if anybody enjoyed my classes, if anybody enjoyed the Persian culture, the Persian hospitality, if anybody enjoyed our friends and the music we played afterwards, that they would be contaminated with my culture, with my people, with my ideas. And then that contamination would force them to become more and more interested and maybe even become very passionate and uh, to the point that they would drop everything and pursue philosophy and humanities and then eventually get the degrees and then teach. How good they are, who the hell knows until you walk in the class. And that's one of the benefits of being young, having energy and being hopeful. And your hopefulness has to do with the fact that you have zero experience, okay? Because if you're a good farmer and you have a bag of seeds, you can see concrete, you can see wood, you can see a land that's useless, and you're just gonna save your seeds, okay? And if you happen to be a really, really good farmer, what you realize is that you have an acre property, but of the acre, there's only five square yards that's useful, okay? Now that is going to make you a pessimist, but it's going to make you an educated cynic. You understand that seeds can grow in concrete or wood or dry land or hard land, okay? Now, there are some people who are just temperamentally you know, dark and gloomy and there isn't much you can do. They're not really educated in the proper way. <clears throat> now, when you get to be a little older, and if you happen to have been somewhat observant of your experiences of people, um, and it's the product of biology is getting older and um, psychologically you're also going to lose a few things. You don't invite people anymore. So, and you don't really care. No. Um, it may be that, let's just say you and I are wrestling and you enjoy this game and you call me and say, Amir, do you mind if I come to your office? there is about an 80% chance I'm going to say no. I'm never going to allow this to evolve into something that I can't protect and nourish. And I can't protect and nourish, you know. If I've known you for five, six, 10, 20 years, that's a different story. But at this stage in my life, no. And so what'll happen is you're left with an impression and then you will try to somehow protect and nourish this impression by perhaps going home and watching Sadhguru on YouTube or Eckhart Toilet or reading a couple of books or maybe taking down some numbers and saying, do you guys want to meet in a coffee shop so we can have a conversation? That's not going to last very long because friendship, uh, friendship, especially friendships that have depth, demand time because in time you create history, you create intimacy. And, you know, you're 40, and he's 40, and she's 40, and none of you have time, your plates are full. And so after a while, whatever seed that was alive inside you will simply slowly die. So there are lots of things to consider, you know. Um, again, it just seems to be all time management. <sighs> there is a good amount of luck involved, you know. Um, and I think, you know, should, should any of you have any desire to make any changes to your life at any level, whether it's physical, whether it's emotional, whether it's intellectual or spiritual, um, you should continue on your quest to figure things out. But in the back of your mind, you should always know that a good amount of luck is also necessary that you need to have the right person walk into your life. That person must be willing. You must also in a place where you're open to suggestion. Because if any of those components are missing, you know, it's, uh, <clears throat> I don't know if I shared this with you, if I have, forgive me. There was a, 
a guy who was being interviewed for a biology physician at a certain school. And so the last question that the committee asks this poor chap is, do you think you're a good instructor? And uh, this person looks at the committee and says, I can be a great instructor, but if I have bad students, I can't teach. I can have great students, but if I don't know my branch of knowledge well, I can't teach well. I may be great, my students may be great, but if on campus there are no labs where ideas can be experimented with, I can't teach. And that's the thing. You know, it's not just a matter of being a good student or being a good teacher. The laboratory, at least when it comes to philosophy, is your ability to interact and to be open and to be as observant as possible, which means that you have to be a bit more detached from your history that forces you to react. Everything, a curveball comes your way. You know, if you're missing any of those components, you may be a great student, I may be a great teacher, but the lab isn't there. You're not open to possibilities. And so, <clears throat> uh, as there was a plaque on Truman's office, the buck stops here, you know, philosophy starts here and ends here. That once it's 10:15, you go your way, I go my way. There is no lab, okay. So yeah, it's intertwined. Thank you. God bless you. <laughs> Even though, yeah, he doesn't exist. <laughs> Any uh, one else before we talk about something more useless? Yes, Josh. This could be a, a modification of a question I asked um, earlier in the week or last week. So. As someone that's been attracted to many uh, teachers' ideas over his lifetime, uh, I'm like easy in that way. Um, and that love in the initial, you know, at the beginning can feel like uh, the one um, uh, until you come to realize that it's not. How does one find? Or maybe you've already answered it when you said it requires a certain amount of love. How does one find their passion? You know, how uh, is or is, is there a method for suggestions around that, or is it just luck when they find their direction in life? Like, for example, say I was to pursue um, philosophy. That the pursuit of that takes a very long time, for one thing, and it may wind up with, you know, with disappointment if your aim is to teach philosophy, because there's a very limited number of jobs, and you need to be good enough at it, or proficient, proficient enough, an instructor, or a good enough interviewer to get a job in that. That's a gig leap of faith. So let me I'm not going to claim I understand your question and uh, you can't even claim that you understand your own question uh, so since <laughs> all of us can't but Assume that <laughs> um, we understand things, so let's just you know take a shot in the dark and see where it goes. Usually, when you fall in love with anything. It's going to be a profoundly unequal relationship. It's a power struggle. No two people love the same. One usually loves more than the other. Okay. So that in itself is profoundly painful. You keep calling and she keeps blocking your number until she just picks up and says, 
What do you want? Not even a hello, how are you? Just what do you want? Now, the thing with love is it pushes you because there is so much passion and intensity involved. It always you pushes you into the present moment. The idea of I love philosophy, I want to teach, that doesn't exist. And the other thing that you need to understand about love is whatever power you have in life, love takes everything away. Love creates an enormous amount of poverty within and without. You know, all the things that used to matter no longer matter. So the idea of you assuming that at a certain point you will land a teaching job and then you will be as great as Socrates, those are things that lovers don't usually think about because they don't exist way out there. All they know is that I love, I can't grab the thing that I love, I hate myself, I hate God, I hate that, and I hate the way I feel. And then you just like drive to the ocean and then you scream. And then on the way back you say, man, I'm really exhausted. And then you look at your phone and say, oh, I have five messages from my lover. And then you hate yourself even more. <laughs> because instead of all that time shouting, you could have been with him. Now, the other thing about love is that it forces you into the psychological darkness. You have no idea what the hell is happening to you. You have no idea where you're going. You have no idea where you're going to find stability. You have no anchor. You know, always, if you want to know what passion and love and pain look like, read the book of Job. You know, like Job, all of us in this class uh, have things put together nicely. You know, and then things happen. And then Job falls apart. And there are no answers. And you have to survive answerless in this darkness for a long, long time. Will you have suicidal thoughts like Job? Absolutely. Will you find yourself completely isolated and lonely and orphaned? Definitely. And you realize one of the nice things about the book of Job, at the very end of the book, you don't get wisdom from your father, you don't get wisdom from your children, you don't get wisdom from yourself, you don't get wisdom from books, you don't get wisdom from the cultural heritage. You get wisdom that comes to you through a whirlwind from God. <clears throat> it's something awesome and you have no power over it. And the only wisdom you will eventually get, you're pathetic. You will never understand anything the right way. All you know is that wisdom is something that you long for. You have moments of it. And when you do have those moments, you become enormously creative and insightful and intuitive. But you have no power over that. You're not the owner of that. It comes to you as a gift, then it goes away. You just need to be a good vehicle for it. You know, um, there is this poem. چون دایره ما ز پوست پوشان تویم در دایره حلقه به گوشان تویم گر بن وازی ز جان خروشان تویم ور نن وازی هم از خموشان تویم So there are two parts to you. You're like this instrument. When you are picked up by someone who is really, really, really good at playing the piano, let's just say Peter Buka, a 22-year-old kid who is amazing on the piano. And you say, I'm a piano. Do with me what you will. Well, what he wills is majestic. It's divine. It's beautiful. And then you say, okay, and then you go to your nine-year-old. And you say, do with me what you will. And he just bangs on you. And you say, damn, I got a headache. And so what you have is this. You have, and let me use Heidegger for a moment the German philosopher. You have your unto death moments. In other words, you're consumed after a good amount of wrestling where you're passionate, you want to understand. 
And because it's so intensely needed, this desire, and usually when you need something, you go into your toolbox. And in your case, your toolbox is 50 years of your existence. And you open it up, and there is not a single tool that you can dig up and use. Okay. And now you find yourself completely empty. You, your history has given you nothing to combat the things you have right now. And in that nothingness, you become empty. And in that emptiness, you have poverty. And in that poverty, you have humility. And in that humility, you beg, you pray for someone to bring you something that's useful. Now, if you're like Gilgamesh, someone up there, if there is someone out there, all of a sudden, this force comes down. And then it plays with you. And let's say you're at a place where in life you can express uh, the descending force, whatever it may be, however it's coming to you, from whatever source, you're able to express it. And then you hear yourself talk. And you fall in love with the way you say, say things. And you say, I can't really even claim ownership to the things I'm saying. All I know is that it's beautiful. Okay. And then there are these other moments where it's just chatter, as Heidegger would say. It's gossip. How are you doing? What's for dinner? What grade am I going to get? What's the format of this essay? How long will it take for me to graduate? These are just everyday, nonsensical chatter that we have no choice but to engage because we are political animals and need to survive. And then after a while you say, okay, this is me, and when I talk, I am intoxicated. It sounds a little arrogant to be intoxicated by your own self, but that's exactly how it happens. And then there are these other moments, that's about like 15 hours out of the day, where it's just chit chat and you hate yourself. And then you come to a place where you say, I'm a vehicle, I'm an instrument. If this force is not descending, if it's not doing its alchemy on me, I am meat, but once this force comes down, I become gold. You know, it's like right now you just have sex. But man, when you fall in love, this sex is the most magical thing. It's the most beautiful gift you will ever receive in your life. Because you can touch God down here. You find your paradise, the Garden of Eden, in the cradle of another human being. And it's something that it's rarely experienced. And most of us experience it, you know, but it only lasts for about two weeks, maybe two days, maybe just a minute. Who the hell knows? And so the poem is, if I'm not picked up by this other thing that I can't describe, I'm just going to be mute. I don't like to hear myself gossip. I feel cheapened. I feel like meat. And you only say that because you've experienced this other part to you and you refuse to go back. You know, um, this comes from the Islamic tradition. Let me just say it and then we'll go home. Uh, the first perfected being, the first perfected human being in the Islamic tradition is Adam. And this is how the story goes. That you have Adam in the Garden of Eden. And they have everything without working for it. And God throws out this, this temptation, you know, go anywhere, do whatever, just don't go there. Because God knows something that Adam and Eve don't know, even the serpent doesn't know. That if you've been given millions of dollars, the truth is you don't know how to earn money with your own blood and sweat. Your relationship with money is cheap. Money will use you like a prostitute. And you're not going to be frugal in an educated way, okay? And so what happens, Adam and Eve, they go to the tree, they fall. They're expelled. And they realize life down here is really, really awful. Not only is it hard, but when you work really hard, at the end, you don't really have much. You buy a house, it becomes a home for two weeks, then it goes back to simply being a house. Just a cage, you know? You fall in love, then it becomes like a prison system. You have kids, you love them, 
but they just turn it into pain and hate, terror and disappointment. Okay? And you realize everything you touch down here, as Dante would say, it just turns into crap. It takes a while for Adam and Eve to understand this. And Adam begins to pray. I want to come back home. I don't, want to, I don't belong down here. I don't want to be down here. And there comes a point where God says, now you've understood your lesson well. You can come back. You know, and <clears throat> initially when you find yourself in these inspired moments and you like these very, very rare moments where you're just changed from me to a spirit, they leave a mark inside you somewhere. But most often, you just engage in life. But as this other part of you grows and becomes more intense, there comes a point where you say, I refuse to participate in life. It's just not worth it. And the only way I will participate in life is if I love. If I don't love, I will not have sex. If the conversation is not meaningful, I'm not going to engage. If the class is not inspiring, I'm not going to enroll. And that's such a difficult place to be because life is not designed for that particular function. Life is there to feed your belly and protect your flesh. It doesn't care about your spirit. So uh, it's good to see all of you. Have a nice weekend. Uh, and so... Thank you. Um, we had talked before about um, if